Hello, I am Dapper Dan Gavazdin, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which definitely count. And I'm Mischievous Mark Trinacchio, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, including the annual that will be discussed a little bit today. Uh, but the annuals don't count, even though they kind of count for this guy, I guess. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, thank you guys for joining us for the second episode of Season 5 of The Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. If you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app. Every other week, we put out a mainline episode of our flagship show, and sprinkled in between, we review new comics as well as interview some of the greatest Spider-Man creators of yesterday and today. So this is the perfect time to start listening. Yeah, and in this season of the all-new Amazing Spider Talk, we're going back to the mid-80s, where comics were changing, embracing a new visual style, aging up with their audience just a little bit, and ditching formulas that had defined serialized superhero comics for decades. For Spider-Man, that change came with the beloved run of Roger Stern and John Romita Jr., a short but unforgettable series of comics whose impacts are still felt in today's webbed adventures. So in today's episode, we are going to be discussing the artwork of John Romita Jr. With our guest, John Romita Jr. Yes, that is correct. John is here with us. That's, of course, John Romita has had a historic career with multiple runs on Amazing Spider-Man and other Spider-Man titles. He's also done Daredevil, Uncanny X-Men, Kick-Ass, Superman, Batman, and so many more. If you want to read along, John Romita Jr.'s run on Amazing Spider-Man alongside Roger Stern is mostly available on Marvel Unlimited and covers Amazing Spider-Man numbers 224 through 227, 229 through 236, 238 and 250, and annual number 16. Uh, but like, you know, you should just read all the stuff that John Romita Jr. has done because his artwork is, is legendary. This is truly one of the greats, Dan. We, we have one of the greats joining us today, and I couldn't be happier about it. Yeah, I wish I could just spend every day reading nothing but John Romita Jr. comics, but I guess right now we're going to do the next best thing, which is talk to the man himself. So let's roll the interview. Well, now let's meet one of our amazing spider friends, the kind of guy that the other friends would recommend. Find out about the things they created. You'll love them so much that you wish you dated. But you're just friends. They're an amazing friend. A friend, a friend, a friend. They're an amazing friend. All right, Dan. Well, we are very, very excited uh, for to have our next guest on the show. I mean, this is you know one of, one of the true greats to have worked on this character that we have been obsessing over over the last seven or eight years of our of our show. Dan, this is the great John Ramita Jr. Uh, I don't know if he really needs an introduction or a bio for people who listen to our show, but you know, I I, I will give the best summary that I can. He's enjoyed multiple runs on Amazing Spider-Man. He's worked on Peter Parker Spider-Man. He's also worked on tons of other amazing, iconic characters for Marvel and DC. Uh, he's done Kick-Ass uh, with Mark Millar. I mean, the, the, the guy has done it all and now he's on our show. And this is, this is really fantastic. John, thank you so much for coming on our show. That's an exhausting intro, but I'll, I accept. And thank you very much for saying all those nice things. Oh, our, our, our absolute pleasure. Um, let, let's just get right to it, John, because we got a ton that we want to ask you about. Um, I mean, the first is kind of related to your origin story as an artist and, and specifically with Spider-Man. I, I want to ask you, do you remember about how young you were when you discovered Spider-Man? And, and, and also, how far apart was that discovery from the discovery that your dad drew Spider-Man? Because I'm sure those were two pretty cool revelations for you as a kid. <laughs> the, honestly, the, uh, the first time I saw Spider-Man was, was on a Daredevil cover. And the two of them were swinging towards each other because my father had been working on Daredevil at the time. And, uh, and then my brother actually had inquired about Spider-Man before I did. I was still a relatively young guy. And my brother explained to me who Spider-Man was. And then I went and drove my father crazy for a couple hours. <laughs> uh, and that's all attached to the, 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 the absolute top of my head blowing off about Daredevil being a blind superhero. 
on that uh, uh, Kazar cover, but the, the plunderer, and I think it was Dead Over Number 12. But after the, the, the meeting of Spider-Man and my father patiently explaining the difference between the two characters, Daredevil is more balletic and Spider-Man is more awkward, but he's unbelievably strong, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they, it just was a constant conversation about how weird Spider-Man was compared <laughs> to Daredevil. But Spider-Man lived not too far from us. So again, the top of my head blew off. Whereas Daredevil lived in, in Manhattan. So uh, the, the conversations were always about Spider-Man after that. And then when he began to draw Spider-Man, it wasn't so much uh, the order of uh, the, how you asked it. It was in a casual conversation with some friends that well, we talked about Spider-Man. And they said, wow, is he really drawing Spider-Man? And that's when, you know, as a kid that age, have something uh, start a conversation and keep a conversation where people ask you about it in an awkward, at an awkward time in your life. It just blew up after that. Yeah. And then the more they asked, the more uh, answers, the more questions I would ask my own father. And then things like Stan Lee would come around the house and Jack Kirby would come around the house and so on. <laughs> but the, the inquiring minds were not so familiar with those guys until they found out who they were. And what they had done. And it suddenly began to uh, just roll all of the things about comics. And I watched it blow from that low point, not low point, but quiet point, not too long after my father had been doing romance comics. <laughs> suddenly he was a mini rock star in our neighborhood. It just was fantastic. You know, when uh, when you like talk to coal miners about their like children, they tend to say, we don't want you to go into the coal mine. You know, like I've had enough of the life in the coal mine. And, you know, obviously your father you know, worked in comics or to put it mildly, you know, was there a point that you realized that you wanted to work in comics? Was it an admiration of your father or a close relationship there? Um, and, and, and was there doubt in his mind about you kind of coming into the industry that he, that he shared? Good question. The, the moment that I was watching him draw the uh, Daredevil number 12 cover is when I sat down and wouldn't budge from his, his side. And uh, then the questions about Daredevil, blind superhero, Baba Baba, and explaining superheroes, just like he said, just like the comics you saw at the um, barbershop where there was Superman and metal men on the floor, he was explaining superheroes to me. So I would sit at his side at, at, on the floor and draw as a little kid would scratch on paper and so on, but I was constantly doing it and I was always doing it. And he was encouraging me to the extent that you encourage an eight year old or a nine year old or a seven year old, whatever it was at the time. But the, the, the idea that I was going to become a cartoonist didn't happen until sometime in high school when I realized the only thing I could be decent at to go to college for was art. Because in high school, I was relatively better than o almost everybody else. Just, and just because I was drawing superheroes, scratching stuff all over the place. But I did have a little bit more than the average guy. And I realized that I, I enjoyed it. I had a, far, a father who was an artist. And I said, this might be the right place, uh, uh, my point for me to become uh, a college student and have an art, an art curriculum. And my parents said, fine, fine. But... My father said, but you, you're not, you're not going to be a cartoonist. You're going to be a, a fine artist, you know, be a painter, do anything. Just don't be what I'm doing. Cause my father would go days without sleeping mm -hmm. and he would have the beard on and, and uh, would be exhausted all the time, but he always had time for me to discuss it, except I don't want you to be a cartoonist. I want you to be an artist first and then decide where you go. Everything he said made sense, but only after I became an adult. And when I was a kid, I was, I was impul impulsive. And, and who listens to their parents when you really want something? Yeah. And the more comics I read, the more I wanted to be a cartoonist. And that's the way it worked out. Did, did you spend a lot of time like studying his kind of pencil work, uh, you know, while he was doing it? Was that, I mean, you said you looked at that Daredevil 12 cover, you know, was that kind of like a, a childhood of soaking up your father's artwork? After that, I began to look at his uh, uh, Captain America comics that he had in boxes. Uh, and I began to look at anything he did as even the romance work. I started looking at it. 
uh, and to tell you the truth, I remember thinking to myself, I wish I could do this. And then, of course, when he brought other books to the house, uh, I would look at that and say, wow, that's pretty neat. Even Steve Ditko's stuff, which was so stylized and Jack Kirby's stuff stylized. Wow, look at that. Uh, and so on. And I would ask my father, well, why did he draw this like this? And I got explained style and so on. Uh, but he was always patient when I had questions. However, when I decided to do it out of high school and it was an advertising curriculum, it was because, I mean, the college that I was going to, it was because several of the guys, his contemporaries were advertising artists. And I said, well, this, hey, you know, in the back of my head, I thought I was being clever. And he said, don't think because you're going to go to advertising that you can become a cartoonist. I'm smarter than that. Don't be a wise ass. <laughs> And it, again, I, I fought with him to a certain point, but being an advertising illustration guy, uh, I knew that I could eventually even try get, getting into advertising. And I was, I was good at it. I, was, I had fun in school in advertising and there was plenty of illustration. And then I'd go, I'd go home from school and I would draw. It just became an avalanche. It just kind of rolled. So kind of talking about early contributions of yours with the comics. And, and I, I'm actually going to start this off with something. I don't know if it's considered an urban legend or not, but hope, maybe you can clear this up. I've, I've read in some, in some spots that um, you created the concept for the Prowler, and that was considered like your first character pitch for Marvel. But then I guess uh, uh, John Buscema and Jim Mooney kind of like, you know, came up with the visual idea for it, but it was your idea to have a character called the Prowler. What, what, what's, what's the, the truth of meter on that? What's, what's, what's the, what's the story behind that? That's the truth. I came up, I had been drawing, playing with uh, uh, some characters and some spandex characters. Mm -hmm. And I had a character named the Prowler and I showed my father and I, I think I was 12. And uh, he said, that's really cool. I said, can you show somebody and can you show Stan? Because at the time he was working with Stan. Right. And he did. Stan said, I don't like the artwork, but I love the character. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And that's where it went. I don't remember if my father was actually drawing that book or not. I don't remember. But I think he worked on the cover. I think he did the cover. And, and uh, yeah, uh, I got credit for it on the inside page. And that oh. was, the, you know, a third time I had blew off the top of my head. I was going to say, I, I, create, made, I created the name of it. Yeah. Did you bring that to school the next day? <laughs> be like, check this out. No, everyone. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't do that. But if somebody were to ask me any questions, I would take a huge leap to get to that point, to bring it into the conversation. <laughs> but a lot of people weren't as familiar with comics as, as you might think. I that was 60 something, 68. I think it was. Yeah. It, it wasn't as big as it became a short time later, but, uh, the conversation would, would reach it. And my father would even volunteer at some time. Even Stan volunteered it a couple of times when he saw me. He called me by the wrong name. And then he would say, oh, by the way, he created a character. You know. <laughs> Why does he get your name wrong? <laughs> <laughs> my father thought it was accidentally on purpose that he would do that. Just to keep me quiet, you know. Understood. Well, sp speaking of uh, uh, other firsts, uh, you know, one of your first stories from Marvel was Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 11, which is the, the chaos at the coffee bean, one of our favorite places, um, uh, which I still, uh, I think it's an Aster place, but I'm not sure. Uh, okay. did, you, did you feel it was inevitable uh, at some point that your path would cross so quickly with Spider-Man, given your roots, or was like happy circumstance? Happy circumstance. I just got lucky that uh, Archie Goodwin would allow it. And then uh, Al Milgram saved it. And it was six, eight pages. I forgot what it was. And it was palatable, but I thought I was awful. And I was terrified that I wasn't going to get any work after that. So, uh, uh, again, I'm my own worst critic to this day. I'm still my own worst critic. And I think that's what keeps me wanting to get better. At that time, I, I, if I was an alcoholic, I would have made it worse. I just was miserable. I thought it was awful. Yeah. Well, 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 well not to pile on and, and make you criticize yourself some more. But one of the, the other things that I've read 
a lot about you in other interviews is, you know, some of the earliest work, like putting aside the, the coffee bean, uh, but like your earliest work with like Denny O'Neill on ASM and on Iron Man, that you didn't, you didn't love the work. You didn't feel that they were engaging you as much as a storyteller. I mean, what was, you know, that your style wasn't coming through? I mean, do you remember... I mean, what were you trying to to get across with those with those early assignments? I mean, I, I mean, is that I guess I should also ask: Is that true? Do you still feel that way in retrospect? I mean, what's what's your take on that like early era of of like your kind of ongoing Marvel work? Uh, great subject, great points. Uh, I actually was not allowed to do a lot. I was doing breakdowns, even though it felt like I was doing tighter pencils. Uh, the, the going thought was that I needed somebody to make my stuff palatable. Mm -hmm. uh, and the storytelling was a struggle because I was so young, but I had an idea what I wanted to do. So it was, uh, I was unhappy in that I wasn't given a, a chance to do what I wanted to do, but it, it wasn't noticeable to me per se until, you heard, until I heard things from people that to your face, you're yeah. only here because of your father. So this stuff is only okay. Uh, and, you know, you're, you're really not that good, so shut up. And I would say, Mom, you can't talk to your son like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the truth is that there were people that would say it to my face. And uh, so th whether they knew that that's what was going on with the work I was assigned or not, I don't know. People like Marie Severin and Archie Goodwin, rest in peace, yeah. both of them, uh, said nice things to me, but the younger people and some of the, uh, uh, the staff people were not so nice. Yeah. And they gave me, instead of breaking my, my will, it just got me angrier. And in the words of my father, keep your hands in your pockets, your mouth shut and fight yeah. as an artist. And that's what I did. Fortunately, I had little increments of improvement, but I was kind of held down in that they weren't allowing me to expand. Uh, the I was doing breakdowns and I wasn't allowed. They were giving me such tight scripts. I had I was being fed along the way. And it got me frustrated. And uh, that's why things expanded the way they did to Daredevil and, and et cetera. I was getting ready. I was on X-Men and I was being told what to do, how to sleep, how to breathe by Chris Claremont. Yeah. Who, incidentally, he and I are good friends after all these years. But at the time, he didn't really care for what I was doing. And uh, I wanted I wanted to do more, but I got off the X-Men and I, I was ready to leave. I was actually going to go back to advertising uh, 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 interviews. I had my portfolio already. I was ready to get out. And Ralph Macchio said, wait a minute, before because I said to a couple of people, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to take some time off and disappear for a year. And Ralph Macchio said, no, no, don't, don't do that. He said, I got an idea. And we had a long conversation. And it led to Daredevil. And he said, you do the storytelling. You do some plot input. You do tight pencils. And you're going to work with this lady. At the time, she was in the office with us, Anna Senti, who was an assistant editor. And it worked so well. And was, and was wonderful because she was a great writer. And she allowed me to do what I, what I needed to do. And it seemed to progress rapidly that my storytelling improved because I knew what I wanted to do, but I never had the chance to do it. Mm -hmm. Now I was given the chance to do it. And then Anne played to the strengths. Uh, and she was wonderful. And to this day, I still give her credit for helping me. She and Ralph, really, Ralph Matthews, really significantly advanced my storytelling chops. Yeah. That's, that's, such, well, a, that's such a fun run on the book, too, that, Dare, that Daredevil. With I agree. And, I had, and, all oh, that, and by, the way, was... by the way, having Al Williamson on the book didn't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant illustrator like Al Williamson. Yeah. Oh, man. Hey, uh, just to take a quick break from John here, uh, we want to talk about our Slack. Hundreds of listeners like you hang out in our community of Spider Man fans on Slack. The amazing Spider Slack community is absolutely free to join, and you can jump into active conversations with awesome people about collecting, conventions, movies, new comics, old comics, and more. I spend all of my time hanging out in the Slack. It's probably like the biggest time sink I have in my life, other than reading and writing about Spider-Man comics. But the Slack has just been a buzz ever since we heard that John Romita Jr. would be joining us, and everybody's been over there talking about it. So if you want to join this awesome Spider-Man community, think of it like 
a more personalized forum where you're friends with everybody there and everybody gets along. Just follow the link in the description and be sure to say hi. And once you're there, let us know what you thought of this episode. Uh, Everybody's going to be talking about it there. So uh, we hope to see you over in the Slack. You know, er, er, around the same time in your career, you know, Marvel approached the art in their books in a very different way than they do today, uh, where I, I really feel like each artist's individual style is kind of allowed to shine. That's like really one of the hallmarks of, of modern comics. Um, and, you know, your father was Marvel's art director for a long time and helped to create and maintain their like house style, so to speak. Um, okay. And your style has certainly evolved over the years and moved away from that house style you know, to, to something that's very recognizably yours, you know, just from, you know, looking at it. Um, can you speak to what it was like working in the eighties and trying to push Marvel visually alongside like creators like Frank Miller while still kind of providing that visually cohesive Marvel style branding, you know, uh, adhering to the way that comics have looked under Marvel while still advancing your own style? Good. That's a good question. The, uh, the truth, I, I, as I remember it in my head, was I was too busy trying to make a living. That was it. I remember somebody telling me, you want to get faster, put yourself in hock. So I rented a place and I bought a car. And in order to pay those bills, I had to work fast. But I was conscious only of the storytelling because I had people like Jim Shooter, the, the editor-in-chief, and several other editors telling me that storytelling is vital nine pounds on a page if need be. So I, I worked on that and my art just seemed to drag. I couldn't get myself to improve. They were, my contemporaries were better than me. So uh, I think what I did was worked on this. I worked on the storytelling because Marvel at that time was concentrating on storytelling, the Marvel way, plots. And my art improved because of the storytelling. To this day, my, the storytelling in my books uh, in my stories, I'll do things that take away from the art and people pay attention to this vista. Um, and I, I'm proud of that because if you look at the book and you say, well, you know, you did great illustration and they don't make a comment about the book, that's actually something that goes back to when I was a kid and my father said, got, the book's got to be good. So if I get a compliment on the story, I'm very proud of that. Oh, yeah, and by the way, you did pretty good on the illustration. But I consider my art, eh, okay. I just think I'm a good storyteller. And it really does help. So at some point, I was concentrating on becoming a great storyteller because I didn't feel like the art was following. And I call it deadline style. I had no style. Everybody, Frank Miller had a style. Everybody had a style. Gene, uh, I mean, Steve Ditko had a style. And, and John Buscema had a style. Jack Kirby had styles. So when Frank and I got into the business, Frank had a style and I was vanilla. I, I felt so frustrated. So I just got whatever got done on time. I didn't get yelled at on Monday morning by the production manager. I, I, I felt better about it. And then I actually began to improve and started paying attention to the Joneses. I would watch other artists, what they were doing that were popular. And uh, I was actually paying attention to, to anatomy books and, and taking photographs out of magazines and newspapers and putting them up on the wall. I still have that file, all of the photographs of, of New York City. And then Frank brings up the, the, the water towers because he would climb up top of the building, take pictures of things. And I would take pictures of things. I didn't climb up to any rooftops because I wasn't in Manhattan. But <laughs> I would every chance I get, I would tear it out of a magazine. So things improved begrudgingly, if you'll excuse the expression. I was paying attention to storytelling. And to this day, I'm a better storyteller than I'm an artist. Do you feel like you had that freedom within Marvel to experiment in this way? Or do you feel like there were forces trying to, you know, rein you in to look a particular way with your work? Honestly, there had to have been a point where a couple of people, even my detractors had to nod and say, okay, this is, this is pretty good. Uh, uh, let's go along with this because it, it, it began to ebb the, the, uh, I don't know if it's anger at me, but the disdain towards me being a Romita began to get quieter. Now, maybe because I got a little bit bigger in, in, in stature, I mean, <laughs> physical stature, I don't know. Because if I had hit everybody that deserved to be hit, I might still be in prison at this point. <laughs> so, I, I think at some point the art began to stand up for itself. 
and gave me a little bit of leeway from people that were my detractors. And then slowly but surely things got quiet. And then we began to pay attention to mail and, and interview uh, and, and reviews. And then I heard a whole new set of people that didn't like me, but that's besides the <laughs> it, began <Never>. to ebb. <laughs> it began to ebb and I, and I got a little bit more uh, um, excited about what I was doing. And I felt I had control over what I was doing, uh, but still the art, I was struggling with it. I had a great idea. The roughing out of the pages was so much fun. I would watch movies with my father and I knew what I wanted to put on a page because of a movie I saw. And that made the storytelling so much fun because it was a combination of the things I had been told by editors established every two pages, every page. So I would bring in these great vistas that that I'd seen in a movie recently. Well, that I was paying attention to that, but the art still, the mechanical part of it, the drafting part of it, still lagged. So I was always working at that. And I wanted to shut up every single obnoxious bonehead that got into my face, even years later. Yeah. Well, you were mentioning earlier about, you know, the 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 satisfaction of when the book was recognized for its quality and which kind of bridges to uh, my next question, which was about what what it was like when Roger Stern and you started working together, because I mean, a lot of people consider amazing Spider-Man during that run, like the best the book had been since Stan Lee had worked with Ditko and your father, frankly. I mean, it's, it's considered like a golden era. I don't know about that, but it's a nice compliment. I I mean, (laughs) we're going to be talking a lot about Roger Stern stuff and, and the, the contemporary stuff from that era. And and our, our listeners are super excited about it because it's like a lot of, it's a lot of their favorite stories, whether it be nothing can stop the juggernaut, the hobgoblin saga. I mean, these are a lot of people's favorite stories. Uh, And so I'm, so from your element, I know, you know, you were still trying to, to find your 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 voice, so to speak, with 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 storytelling. But I mean, what what was the what was the dynamic like with you and Roger? I mean, was what, did, did you feel like you had a little more input at this point? I mean, was it kind of more of the same or I mean, or and did you also realize at the time that like the book was doing some great things um, from all angles at that point? A little bit of everything you said. I had known Roger from uh, my first assignment, so to speak, at Marvel was being a, was a production manager. I would wash floors and scrub windows, but uh, I was, a, a, excuse me, a, a, a production assistant, not a production manager. I would do corrections and I would uh, uh, log in pages as they came in. And uh, and that lasted for about two years. I got to know Roger Stern. Uh, he was on staff. And as things developed and we got a chance to work together, Seeing it take off again, there's no reaction the way you is now with the internet. You waited for letters to come in, but you'd get comments from editors. Roger had been an editor and now he's a writer. And he, I, I, he told me once he played to my strengths, I didn't know I had any at the time, <laughs> but he said we had storytelling ideas. And then what he was doing was telling me, this is us. We're right here in town. So let's get that flair. He said, I, one thing I maybe the last thing I remember him saying was, what, what, "What's your apartment look like?" I said, "It looks well, like a normal apartment." He says, "So put your apartment, put your clothes in, put your car in, put your friends in. Let's make this." He says, "The best thing about Spider Man, and maybe I said this, the best thing about Spider Man is it's a New York thing, and we're all New Yorkers." And the only thing we heard from people from out of town was in letters. Didn't come in like it did on the internet, of course. So we were playing to that and the strength about New York and we had great sales. And I would put things in. I would look around my apartment and instead of getting reference, I'd look at the window, look at the windowsill, look at the crack in the windowsill. Holy crap. That kind of thing. It made it a personal item. So when Roger threw into things, never forget Stan saying you have to balance the fantasy with the reality. Too much of one makes you want the other. And it's the great thing about Spider-Man is that he's, a fantasy character, but he's still Peter Parker. Gets the snot beat out of him by the bullies, so to speak. So we combined our desire to make it real with the fantasy, and things started to play up. I mean, the, 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 the juggernaut stuff, I, I love destroying things because of that character. That was so much fun. Uh, later on, when I did the juggernaut and, and uh, Colossus, that's my friend's bar. 
That was the grand title. <laughs> and I put my friends in the background and they destroyed my friend's bar. And he, to this day, still brags about that. <laughs> but that was what I wanted to do because I felt like I had a little bit of control and Roger played to that. And Roger was brilliant, of course. So speaking of like the juggernaut, you know, that run was really, uh, and we'll probably talk about juggernaut in a second, but uh, oh, wait, that- wait, one second, one second. I do remember one moment, this little anecdote where the two of us were joking about the, the, the battle, the visual battle. And, and I remember saying, well, I got, I, you know, how can he possibly? And he, Roger says, just imagine this. He says, just like the, the, the uh, you know, a Bugs Bunny cartoon or Daffy Duck trying to fight the big strong guy from the bar. He said, imagine Daffy Duck's going all over the place and he's not doing anything. It's his picture of Spider-Man with the Juggernaut. And that kind of thing, that's the kind of conversations we would have over the phone. And the two of us, of course, were, you know, Warner Brothers cartoon fans. But anyway, go ahead. I'll let Mark take it away because that's his favorite story of all time. So he's got to I mean, ask you about that. Yeah, I mean, I was actually on. We we had Tom Brevoort on last uh, last year, and we were talking about favorite stories. And you know, it's it's one of the honestly, it's one of those questions that kind of like rotates with me. But in that moment, and I think it's still true. I I, I was like, nothing can stop the juggernaut for me. Like. It, to, I, I, I did want to ask you specifically about that because like, you know, to me, what, what really elevates that story is like the, that feeling of relentlessness and stakes. And like you said, like Spider-Man's desperation, it is, I mean, the Bugs Bunny analogy is perfect because it just feels there like is that scene. We did that scene with him climbing all over the, the Punisher. The, yeah. <laughs> joking on, sorry. Yeah. I mean, punished. so, so, I mean, I, I'm curious, like from your end, I mean, so it sounds like you and Roger talked through that a lot. I mean, you know, like some of the some of the the, the different pratfalls and, and things that he does to stop him. I mean, like they're pretty. I mean, at one point, I think he hits him with a, you know, has him runs into him with a truck. <laughs> I mean, so, That's right. so, I mean, how, how much was that? Did, did you did you kind of push anything visual, uh, you know, from your end? Like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if. He did this or did that, or, or was that kind of a little driven more it was a combination, a combination yeah. of the two of us. He would throw in uh, either a, a phone call or uh, if, the, if the script hasn't been uh, the plot, excuse me, they were plots back then. He would throw little uh, written handwritten things on the side. How about this? And then I would call him and say, how about I add this? The specifics I couldn't get into, but I do recall the two of us trying to get it. For instance, the, the fact that the juggernaut fall, walks into a, a, the wet cement. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, the, he could walk out of it if he's that strong because it's not hardening on him that quickly. Right. But the size of that, that kind of thing, uh, the only way to stop him would be something like that. Uh, the two of us were constantly going back and forth with little things. Phone calls, literally phone calls. Uh, but I couldn't get you, get you specific moments. We just did everything we could to expand on the fact that the juggernaut is unstoppable and even Spider-Man, our hero, can't do anything about it. Is that kind of relationship with a writer something that you uh, have experienced many times or is that a, like a unique scenario no, where that's you're actually, calling people up? Whether it's me or them, we, the conversations, uh, for instance, with Frank, the same way with Frank Miller. Uh, but with writers, you have to have a personal relationship with them. If you don't, then it's going to, the, the job might suffer. Uh, I got along with everybody. I, sh- you know, I knew when to shut my mouth and put my hands in my pocket and shut up. But the point is the writers were interested. And as I got better, uh, there was a little bit more respect and more questions asked of me. What do I think? As opposed to this is what you're supposed to do, kid. Uh, and then, of course, I started working with guys my age, et cetera. But when I worked on Spider, um, excuse me, Daredevil, and then it gave me this ability to show people my storytelling chops, then suddenly I, I remember Frank coming up to me in the office saying, well, I didn't know you could tell a story like that. Wait, I wonder where you got it from, being sarcastic. So it, it helped so much that I was able to work. And then when I got a chance to work with Chris Claremont again, then it was suddenly I was given a little more respect. Uh, and it kind of blossomed and ultimately working on a job with Frank man without fear is, uh, one, one of the great moments at that time, because he said, I appreciate how you do tell the story. I've followed your stuff and you and I will be perfect together. So he'd give me a little bit, a plot and it, it took off from there. So I was getting a little bit more credit from the writers as opposed to previously. And the, and the fun part was 
I, I got better, not because of them saying anything like that. It's just I was soaking up their ideas and turning them into what I wanted to put down as a storyteller. And the ultimate uh, uh, expansion of that is the kick-ass thing. Somebody asked me, how are you going to do, what are you going to do with all of this violence and foul and, and adult material? I bounced it off my wife and my wife, Kathy, said to me, just do what you normally do. Just put the blood and the guts and the, and the boobs and the ass in it as if they had <laughs> costumes on. But, and it was so simple. I can't believe I didn't think of it. But that's how I applied storytelling. I just took everything that people threw at me and I did it the way I would imagine a film being done or I, all the films I watched with my father. Uh, no cable back then, a couple of channels, but on the weekends when it would rain or snow, sit in front of a TV with my father and he would tell us what's coming up in a movie. Yeah. This scene, you got to see this scene. My brother would get up and walk away and, and, and cure cancer in the other room. I was sitting there with my mouth hanging open and my father would say, Why, wait till you see what happens on the waterfront. Wait till you see this fight. They're going to beat the crap out of Marlon Brando, but watch what happens. It was film noir, that kind of thing. That, oh, boom, it blew up. And it became that way with writers. They would throw things at me and instead of telling me how to handle an idea, they'd say, what would you think with this? And I was able to play with it. So uh, I guess my ego felt great, but it, instead of th concentrating on that, I was concentrating on what I could do better because I got told a couple of times, you're uh, doing better stuff than a couple of other people here. You better keep this up. This is great. You know, your head suddenly, <laughs> all the blood goes to your head, you know? It's like telling an athlete that they're doing great. Shit, I want to get better. Yeah, exactly. Now, now how do I push it further? <laughs> um, so, I mean, obviously, you are you ha were well versed in in Marvel and the Marvel universe throughout your your entire time there. But I I, I did want to ask you a little bit about one of the kind of uh, quirks of the of your run with Roger, which was that he he seemed to rely a lot on using villains that were not typically associated with Spider-Man. I mean, there was less Doc Ock and, you know, Goblin stuff. Oh, uh, there was Hobgoblin, obviously, but I mean like Green Goblin or, and so I'm curious from your standpoint as an artist, when you're getting scripts from or plots from Roger and you're seeing like, we're going to use Mr. Hyde or Cobra. I mean, are you like, are you like what, in a yeah, panic at monster. this point being like, who, who am I, who am I drawing? What am I doing? Like, I mean, or how was that? For That's you? right. What, uh, the Hydro Man and, and the Sandman come together and, and form the Mud Monster. That was that. I think it was always a concerted effort on writers' parts to establish their bona fides with whatever, adding to the characters. Uh, at the time that we were doing that, we had greatness right before us. Uh, it was shining right there every day. Nope, you can't deny it. So in order to stand up and show yourself, you have to come up with something new. You can't hide it. Can't keep on using the Green Goblin and, and Doc Ock. So Roger would come up with ideas. I'd come up with ideas. It happened that way in Daredevil too. Um, when Ann say, "Give me some ideas. What do you want to? What do you want to work on?" That's that's that great camaraderie between the writer and the artist. And that's what we did with Roger. And uh, it, a couple of things worked out. Listen, the first thing I did was two miniature nuclear scientists. <laughs> literally two dwarf scientists now there is a watershed moment in comics history <laughs> <laughs> um, so we you just, know, it was it was a great give and take on, on the other end of the spectrum from fusion is uh mark and i are i think it's safe to say our favorite villain is the hobgoblin and thank you thank one you. of our favorite villain or moments in all of amazing spider-man history is from Issue 238, the Hobgoblin's reveal, and there's that slow burn reveal of him slowly suiting up and the big half page splash reveal of the man himself. Uh, we just love the, the cinematic th theatricality, the, but something that only could be done in comics in, in, in that manner. And, um, you know, I've always been curious how intricately mapped out were those pages uh, you know, by you, Stern, and I, and I believe your father also worked on that issue. Yeah, 200th ish, 200 anniversary, 200 issue anniversary, of my right, father's right. first issue. Uh, I, I don't remember the specifics of what was in the plot, but again, these were plots. And then Roger would throw in his suggestions. I don't remember if he suggested any of the imagery 
or all of the imagery. I don't remember. Uh, but it, like I said, I will give us both credit by saying it was a nice combination of the two of us because we knew what we wanted to do. And we knew about uh, the, 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 the drama, the visual drama that we could perform on a page turn. However, again, the, my visual sense had improved, to the, my storytelling visual sense had improved to, to instead of reading a couple of pages of a, of a plot and then being baffled, I knew immediately what I wanted to do. I, I just knew it. I saw it because I say this would look great on a movie screen. Uh, but then Roger's input was, was, was wonderful. I can't give you a definitive answer as to who came up with it. But those little vignettes, I'll take credit for a couple and I'll give Roger the other credit. That, that, it's a nice combination of both. I'm playing Switzerland on this one. How about that one? <laughs> well, you can keep the mystery of a character going for hundreds of issues on a reveal that stunning, right? Like you, okay. you, you just, you want to hang with it because this guy is so intriguing. Yeah, definitely. I, listen, it was such a ripoff of the Green Goblin. I don't take any, <laughs> come on, come on. I, you know, he's on, a, he's on a glider and he's got a cave. <laughs> All right. He's got a, a hood and he, oh, he's got a point though. Got a point in front of him. It's not a normal. Yeah, uh, and one eye is bigger than. And I remember making one eye gigantic because I didn't want him to look exactly like the Green Goblin. I was already embarrassed over the fact that we ripped off the Green Goblin completely. <laughs> but then I remember somebody telling me, "Don't worry, the Green Goblin was a rip off of the Joker, so we're even." You know? Okay. <laughs> so, but I so don't the, take the credit. The character became a great character, but the creation of it, the visuals was. All right, let's be honest. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well there there, there 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 you have it everyone it's the, the hobgoblin <laughs> <laughs> so the other part of the hobgoblin story and this this might be certainly a, gr a prime example of where we as fans probably care about something more than the creators themselves do so <laughs> so so you have to indulge me with this question but sure. the, so the when it came to the identity of the Hobgoblin, who was under the mask, it seems like this was something that took on a life of its own. I mean, more so after you and Roger left the book. Like, I mean, there, there, there's there, been stories of like back office drama. We've had interviews with the Falco and Ron Friends and Christopher Priest and all, and, you know, all this. It's going to be this person, no, that person. And then Roger comes back years later and it's Roderick Kinsley. And everyone's like, where did this come from? So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. Did you did you know then and there what Roger's intentions were for the character in terms of his identity? And did you get involved or did you I don't say involved? Did you care at all or were you aware of some of the, the i guess I the remember fighting thinking, going on with this I thing i remember thinking i think harry osborne because his father was the green goblin that kind of thing a simplistic yeah. uh, idea uh and i don't remember how it worked out but roger was i remember roger agonizing over it and that was pretty much it and then it played out the way it did i, I ned leeds was it ned leeds i don't even remember at some point how many different uh, ideas did he have in his head uh but I couldn't remember, I, I couldn't offer up any better ideas because he was agonizing over what he wanted to do. So yeah. anything I threw in was, like I said, Harry Osborne because of the father. And you can't do that. <laughs> so that's that. <laughs> did, that. Did, would he give you any kind of like direction in terms of like the way that the character operated out of costume as some sort of way to clue in the audience or visual cues to include to, to like just shadows until we revealed that yeah. kind of thing. Just be, you know, be spooky. Uh, it played itself out because we didn't know what we wanted to do. So that was part of what I was trying to do. We don't know what we're doing here, folks. So let's just be sneaky. And I mean, when you work on a character like that and then, you know, basically someone else does the reveal years later, I mean, do you feel any kind of investment in that or do you just, you know, whatever you've moved on. I mean, what's, 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 you know, what's your emotional I moved on, But I, I, I was paying attention to what was happening afterwards. And, but I still took pride in it. Uh, I didn't have it. I didn't have an effect on the alter ego. Uh, but I was proud of the way the character progressed. Um, just uh, sometimes characters do better without me. Look at <laughs> Dazzler. My God, my God, Dazzler became a great character in the X-Men. Was not a great character when I created her. 
But again, when characters do better, and if nobody makes fun of me, ha ha, see, we did a better job, then I'm happy to see the character progress. But uh, it, it did well, and the character is still doing well, so I'm happy. So like you said, you were also working on Uncanny X-Men, you know, around the same time as Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, I'm curious, when you left that first time, uh, uh, Amazing Spider-Man, was it strictly for workload reasons or you know, was that more an editorial decision? Uh, probably the workload. Uh, it was too much doing a group book and then Spider-Man. Uh, but I got a chance to do the X-Men and, and uh, great, great experience. And then the phone call from John Byrne uh, out of the blue saying, I'll give you two years and you'll burn out. <laughs> and it wasn't, he, it wasn't snarky or nasty. He was just saying, this is a rough go. Yeah. And I lasted four years because I remember thinking after two years, ah, now nah, I want to hear Byrne bust my balls at a convention. So I, I lasted a little longer. Uh, it was tough. And working with Chris Claremont is tough, not because he's a difficult person, because his, I, his stories were immense. They were gigantic. Yeah. And you couldn't argue with how good the, 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 the characters did and how well the book did. You can't. So I just, I felt like I was holding on to the tiger's tail, so to speak. But Spider-Man, I could not keep up with both. It didn't last that long anyway that I was doing both. Yeah. How, how quickly did you miss working on Spider-Man? <laughs> I don't remember. But I always miss working on Spider-Man. Always. I won't say anything else. <laughs> Hey, sorry to jump in here, but I wanted to talk about our Patreon. If you find this show entertaining and valuable, and you're enjoying this interview with John Romita Jr., please consider supporting us. Recommend Amazing Spider Talk to a friend, and if you're able, become a member on the Patreon. We can only bring you this content with the support of our Patreon members, and we owe the show's success to every single one of them. And we are constantly making exclusive content for our members. This week, Patreon members will hear Dan and my review of Amazing Spider-Man number 62. So why not take $3.99, that's the price of a new comic, mostly, and put it towards a month subscription to support the show and start receiving our Patreon content. That way you'll hear our Patreon-exclusive review podcast on every new issue of Amazing Spider-Man the same week it comes out, instead of waiting for it to arrive in our public podcast feed. Plus, sometimes we even put stuff we cut out of interviews like this one or one you're listening to right now on the Patreon for you to listen to. And if you contribute $10 a month, you gain access to exclusive artwork from famous Spider-Man artists commissioned exclusively for our members. This season, we'll be mailing out a print of Spider-Man fighting Dr. Octopus as his friends look on, drawn by official Marvel artists Federico Vintantini in colors and inks. And gosh, Dan, as much as I love Federico's art, having to say his name every week is going to be really interesting because I always get it wrong. Plus, every episode, we release a new episode-specific desktop background created for us by artist Nick Cagnetti for our patrons to enjoy. Well, we're just lucky that Nick's name is really easy to pronounce, um, and his art is just as good. <laughs> yes, very much. <laughs> you know, it's funny, the, the minute that we started recording this, I sent you the artwork from Federico because it came in that minute, and uh, it was stunning, and I think people are going to be really thrilled by it. One of our best commissions yet. Awesome. Yeah, but, um, you know, we know it's a hard time for everybody, as it is for us, too. So we appreciate anyone who supports the show just by listening and sharing. But if you do have the means and you want to help us continue doing the show and you're enjoying things like this John Romita Jr. interview, please join our Patreon to support the continued existence of our show. Just follow the link in the description. And again, thank you to all the members who already make this show possible. So obviously... Speaking of missing Spider-Man, I mean, you would go on to return to Spider-Man various times following your run with Roger. And, you know, it was very clear Dan that, that it, what's that? Dan Slott. Yeah. Worked well, Dan, Dan Slott, Slott uh, J JMS. I mean, you, 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 I mean, so, but your style, it seemed like each time you, you, you came back, your, your style had evolved more. I mean, from your end, what, what what was different about what, how yeah. you were approaching the character and and you know what, great, what did you you know we see something but what did you see when you were all right great that? segue and I'm going to try to be brutally honest I had a conversation with my father about 
um, shading characters to give them weight, substantial weight, strength, feel like they're walking. He said, just look at Kirby's stuff. Look at Buscemi's stuff. Look what I'm doing here. When a character walks, they leave a print. And when the Hulk walks, he leaves a print. And so he said, give them mass and bulk. And then I got to my boxy stage because I was trying to make everybody look three dimensional. That was the only time I ever made a concerted effort to stylize the work, which affected, I mean, to change the work that was affected by desire. After I got comments that were not particularly nice, I uh, had slimmed things down, but I still managed to, con to, to combine the three dimensional to, to the characters and the characters had more substance to them. That was fun in that I affected my style briefly and then I learned that it was not that accepted. It wasn't that great, but there was some good things to it. And I managed to tone it down a little bit and give mass to the characters. And I learned a couple of things and I got laughed at at conventions. Why is everybody so boxy, man? You know, and then everybody had to have a certain amount of musculature. Uh, but Spider-Man was lean, so I had to lean him out. And somebody complained that his ankles were too skinny. So it was a combination of going to shows and finding out that there were some reactions to what my what I was doing came to the point where I realized I did not want to make a concerted effort to change styles. All I could do is improve my art going back to books. I would open up uh, anatomy books and leave them. I would print out, take mimeograph copies of an anatomy book. I still have it. It's way over there, but I'm not going to bore you. Uh, 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 dynamic anatomy. Everybody used dynamic anatomy. So I had it up all over the place so I could draw what I was drawing and get better at it instead of stylizing it and that's the way it was uh i learned my lesson that there were some things that i shouldn't add to that didn't deserve to be added and then i got better as an artist because i was upset that people were not reacting positively uh again every single time i got a negative comment from somebody whether it was a letter or another professional or some drunk in a bar it it inspired me to get better and i got better um not as fast as I could have, as I should have, I should say, but I did improve it. And I am still feeling that urge to, to get told by somebody, maybe in the afterlife, you had one year, 2026, you were the best in the business. Okay. So I got five years to go. <laughs> I always, I, speaking of the, you know, that kind of change, I thrill over looking at your Spider-Man, the lost years book as, as that, like, cause that's, I feel like, you at your like heaviest, like reading that, it's like rain and you know, yeah. weighty inks. And, and I find a certain joy in seeing you unleashed like that. Uh, the you know, film noir, like that. Yeah. The film noir aspect of storytelling. I, I don't remember exactly which film it was that the, the rain got to me, but uh, it, it affected pinups. I did a pinup with my father with Spider-Man on the, the dome, uh, that poster in the rain that I consider one of the best things I've ever done with my five, still have the original. Um, and I loved adding rain and people said, but you're adding, making so much work. You know how many errors and how many mistakes it covers when you put rain into a scene. <laughs> and, and then big smoky billows and uh, that, that stuff, that film noir stuff came from watching films with my father. There's no other way about it. No two ways about it. Uh, just for instance, on the waterfront, 12 Angry Men, uh, a, a country with uh, a, a, a Gary, Gary Peck and Charlton Heston, seeing scenes in that and then watching the black and white film noir movies, soaking it up with my father, I realized that I had a control over things. And then I could add things to it that would help. And the rain thing has stuck. And you can ask Klaus Jansen, if, if you ever get a chance, he would crack up because he would send me back a nasty email or, or a phone call. What is it with you and the effing rain? You're driving me crazy. <laughs> but he enjoyed it. And the two of us succeeded with that. Um, so it, I, I, I just used it as a tool when I wanted to. And I'd ask the writer if it's okay. Or the writer would say, Hey, how about one of your, you know, your scenes with uh, the Philip Marlowe, the hat, the, you know, the, the collar and in the rain, what do you think? Love it. Love everything about it. Going back to the 80s, you know, a, a lot of artists have a really hard time looking back at their work 
and uh, not being pained by it, you know? I like, just look back at my clothing and I get pained by right, it. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> is, is there one moment from that, like whether it's a character that you've drawn or a, like, a, like a story that you're most proud of from that era? I mean, is it it's Juggernaut? The Daredevil, or? Stuff. the Daredevil stuff more so than the Spider-Man stuff because I got a chance to put some characters in there on my own. Typhoid Mary, uh, Blackheart, uh, and then it led to the, the Man Without Fear. Very proud of Spider-Man, wonderfully proud of it, but it had so much built into it that Daredevil didn't. And as I got better on Daredevil and got a chance to add things to it, then the Punisher too. I've made the Punisher look like so many of my friends and relatives because we were getting in fights at bars and my friends would come home and their faces would be twisted. I drew the Punisher that way. Uh, everything was that backstreet grittiness. And with Daredevil, as I got the chance to play with the, the storytelling, I got better and better at it. I, it made me a better artist and then Man Without Fear happened. Uh, but that stuff, I think I can, out, I can say that that Daredevil stuff is as intrinsic to, to my improvement as anything else. Well, um, for our final question, we like to ask all of our uh, creators that we have on the show the same thing, which, which is, you know, personally for, for you, uh, you know, beyond accolades as an artist, but personally, what does it mean to you to have been someone to have worked on the character of Spider-Man to help like craft his legacy of this major pop culture transmedia character? Like, what does that mean to you personally? Uh, unfortunately, in the Romita household, there's no such thing as an inflated ego. It's just the way my father brought us up. I can't tell you that I would stand up on a on a platform or a stage or, or my chair at a convention and say, wow, look what I've had to do with Spider-Man. All I can say is I contributed to a great character, one of the greatest, if not the greatest. I contributed to it. So did everybody else that worked on it. Uh, there was never a point where somebody said, oh my God, that was two years that sucked on the character. It just never happened. The character made the artists and the writers better, uh, maybe more so than other characters. I, I just know that I'm proud of my time on the character. I can't say it any other way, but remember, this, in the words of my father, there's, already some, there's always somebody bigger, bigger, better, stronger, smarter, better looking, and a better artist than you. If you deal with that and you want to get better than that guy, you can't get better looking, but you can get to be a better artist. He said, work on it. I'll never forget that. And my feet were planted firmly on the ground from then on in. Well, great. Thank, thank you so much for joining us, John. And uh, it was great to have you uh, answer all these questions. We're such big fans of your work. And uh, thank you very much. Thank learning you. a little bit behind the scenes is always a pleasure. Yeah, John, thank you very, very much. We really are appreciative of your time here. And My pleasure, stroll down guys. memory lane. I know, I know it's going to be annoying to answer these questions, but uh, no, it, it made our I, day I, for sure. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. And anytime you guys just let me know when you want to talk. Great. Awesome. We'd love to have you back on. See, see okay. you later and, and have a great rest of your week. But alas, Dan, and boy, this is this is a hard episode to have to say goodbye to, but we do have to say goodbye. All good things must come to an end. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning into this episode of The Amazing Spire Talk. And of course, a very, very special thank you to John Ramita Jr. for joining us this week. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to talk to John and I uh, hope we can have him back in the future. Um, and if you're a Patreon member, there might be a little bit something related to that showing up in your Patreon feed uh, this week. So take a look there and um, I don't know, there's like a surprise ish. I'm not sure how to how to. Uh, categorize it but um i think ish, i think ish is good <laughs> so yeah all right well, as much of a tease as i'm gonna get on that um this episode like all was edited by rick coast with production support from andy myers our artwork comes handcrafted by artists ron friends sal buscema ray sumzer and nick cagnetti and our theme songs were produced by rylan bojack and spider madge plus our introduction animation and musical stinger comes from Josh Sutton from the YouTube show Panels to Pixels. That was a lot of fun, Dan, but what do we got coming up in our next episode? 
Well, Mark, I couldn't be more excited to announce the details of our next episode. And I know I said that last time, but we've just got the hits. They're just going to keep on coming here. So um, next episode, we'll be joined by our good friend, Ron Friends, who hasn't been on the show in quite a while. He used to be like a more of a mainstay fixture here on Amazing Spider Talk. But um, we're happy to invite him back. I almost made like a prelude to his season, which is coming up, where I hope to get a lot more <laughs> of Ron Friends. But he's going right, to join right. us to discuss The Kid Who Collects Spider-Man. Uh, I think maybe in my top three Spider-Man issues of all time. I don't know, Mark, where it lands for you. High up there for sure. Uh, if not top three, maybe top five or six for sure. Yeah. So we're going to be doing something a little bit different this time than we've ever done before. I'm really excited for this experiment. We're going to be taking Roger Stern's script, which was like recently rather recently revealed online did you get a chance to read that when it was posted on the internet mark i, I did not dan so this is kind of a shock for me too <laughs> well yeah we're gonna take uh roger stern's script for that uh issue it's like a page uh you know mm -hmm. and that's what makes it so exciting is we're gonna go page by page through ron's artwork together with ron and he's gonna t detail us the creative process for creating that story i mean uh, you know, it's such a beloved story. It's a perfect, you know, melding between art and, uh, you know, writing and Ron kind of channeling his most Dicko, you know, I think he ever drew the character. And, uh, you know, he, Ron brought so much to that script. You know, you read the script, it's literally a page, you know? So, like, it was up to Ron to really bring that to life. And uh, so we're going to go page by page through it. So that means, like, you know, we're going to, it's going to be a podcast and we'll tell you when we're turning the page, but, um, you know, it would be good for you to have the issue out with you while you're listening or to join us on YouTube where we'll have scans of the pages so you can watch along with us. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun in two weeks and we'll be doing it live with Ron on April 11th at, uh, like, let's say about 8 30 PM Eastern standard time. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I've, I've been looking forward to this ever since we came up with this idea. Yeah, Dan, this is like, I mean, as great as this week's episode was and talking about Roger Stern stuff, I mean, like, I mean, to me, like, I mean, this is this is like kind of like the embodiment of everything that we've worked for over the last eight or nine years of this of this show kind of coming coming to a head to have one of the all-time greats uh be able to go over in such detail one of the all-time great stories so i mean what more could you want as an audience member uh it, it, you know like I, I i can't wait for this episode yeah awesome so uh this has been a lot of fun and that is going to be a lot of fun too so uh we hope to see you there whether live or uh later in the recording but uh, yeah, so if you are tuning in live tonight, don't forget, as soon as the show ends, the conversation continues with our audience on YouTube. And if you missed out on Amazing Spider Talk Live this time, we'll be back soon, like I said, in two weeks on YouTube. So go there, subscribe, and make sure you click on that little bell. Smash that subscribe button and click on the <laughs> bell so that it you know alerts you when we're going to be back. So um That'll help you kind of stay on top of the new recordings that we're doing in the future. But as always, you know, Mark, this is a podcast first and foremost, and that will always remain consistent, just like how we end this show. And that is with our eternal motto. So, Mark, <laughs> until you determine that I'm a fool worthy of death and set out to kill me on a personal quest of cleansing the world of people like me, what's our motto? Wow, that that, that seems vaguely familiar, Dan. Um but not as firmly familiar as our motto, which is, of course, with great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. Mm -hmm.